partners for Jesus. Pastor Bobby is, for me, the pastor of pastors, has served the Lord uh, in frontal ministry for over 50 years. And men like that come to add to you, to increase you, to encourage you, and to build you up, but not to hurt you. Um, Pastor Bobby's early ministry experience came from serving as a missionary in both Western and Eastern Europe, a pioneer at heart. He went on to plant three large churches in Texas prior to coming to Virginia to attend Regent University. How many of you have heard of Regent University? Okay, who is the founder? Who can tell you? Pat. While living in Chesapeake, Virginia, uh, Pastor Bobby Hale accepted the senior pastorate of New Life Christian Fellowship and led its growth from 150 to over 3,000 in eight years as he established seven congregations using a um, traditional multiplying model. Consequently, the church was listed among the 200 fastest growing churches in North America in 1996 and among the 100 fastest growing congregations in 97. Pastor Bobby graduated from Regent University with an MA in Practical Theology in 95 and he is currently serving as the International Director of Vanguard Ministries. Additionally, he serves as a founding pastor of Riverbend Church uh, in Suffolk, Virginia. Pastor Bobby earned his doctorate of education in on the organizational leadership and nonprofit management from Nova Southeastern University in North Miami, Florida. After serving as a professor at Regent University, Dr. Hale launched Vanguard Bible Institute, Institute where he serves as chancellor. Dr. Hale is also a senior consultant with the Hale Consulting Group that focuses on finding solutions to churches, ministry networks, and nonprofit organizations. Pastor Bobby continues to travel extensively, preaching and teaching in conferences, seminars, and churches across the United States, as well as more than 45 countries. Dr. Hill is widely regarded as a spiritual father to hundreds of ministry leaders internationally and carries a powerful prophetic and apostolic gifting. For us here at Trinity, uh, in addition to all of this, he's a brother, a covenant brother, and above all, a good friend. On this trip, he's come with his beloved, Karen, and uh, what a wonderful lady. Come on, let's put our hands together for her. And I know that the session today will be a blessing. With a TBC welcome, come on. Let's put our hands together as we invite Pastor Bob. Bless you, Pastor Kingsley. Bless you, Trinity Baptist. You may be seated. God bless you. What a joy it is to greet you this morning, to have some quality time together, equipping and training leaders. I truly believe that the more that we invest in leaders, it will have a direct impact in our church. You know, just on a personal level, I was thinking about this session this morning, and um, I made a practice quite a number of years ago to invest in our leaders at the church and organizations that I lead. So, for example, uh, the church that I currently lead, we pioneered it 11 years ago. And every year in that church, I select five or six of our leaders. Sometimes they are some of our pastoral staff. Sometimes they are elders. Sometimes they are departmental leaders. And I take them to a city somewhere most of the time we go to the Dallas, uh, Texas area, and uh, there is large 
gatherings and conferences that are focused on churches and leaders. And we invest in them. We pay for everything. We pay for their airfare. We pay for their lodging. We pay for their registrations. We pay for everything for three days for them to go to those conferences. And they walk into a conference where there are 5,000 other leaders. You know, that's quite impressive. When you walk into an environment where there are 5,000 other leaders, there's great worship, there's great seminars, there's great opportunities to learn and stretch. And I remember one of my members of my business, uh, we have a business and finance team that helps us with our finances. And a couple of years after doing that, they said, I don't understand. Why are we always spending this amount of money every year? Seems like a lot of money. Every year you're spending this amount of money. I said, you don't understand. I said, that is an investment in our leaders. And I said, when you make an investment, you receive a dividend. You receive a result. And I said, I have absolutely no regret, and we will continue to spend that amount of money every year. And so we have done it continually. And you don't know, uh, whenever I invite someone and I say, we would like to bless you with this trip, they are so touched. They are so encouraged. Just the fact that we would regard them as, as valuable and that we can invest in them. And so um, although we didn't send you off to, uh, to Amsterdam or to Aberdeen or to Belfast, <laughs> you are right here close to home. But Pastor Kingsley and your leaders are investing in you. This is an investment today. And we appreciate you participating and benefiting from that. Let's see. Do I have anybody that's helping me with the slides today? Or you're going. You're, you're coming. Oh, we're going to try the clicker today. Today. All right. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, sir. We appreciate it. And where do you project that pointer? All right. We'll do our best. <laughs> Let me tell you what my uh, concept was for today's training. And I think based upon time, um, I have a schedule, but it's a little bit off. So I think what we're going to do is we'll just go for us. I'm, I'm going to need, okay, can y'all, yeah, y'all need to be able to see that, but I wanna, I'm going to use that marker board too. So uh, I'll just walk over there whenever I need it. That'll be fine. Uh, we're just going to teach for a while. Uh, we'll make sure that after key sections that we have some questions and answers. So you be thinking Maybe write down if you have a question that you would like to ask. My only request is that we keep the questions related to the topics. Because as you know, we could be here for three days just answering questions about <laughs> life and church and <laughs> things like that. Uh, so I, I want to dig into some subject matter today. Uh, the, some things that I've been studying over the past year. And uh, I think it will be helpful for you. And I, I believe that most of it will be fresh and new for you, and not just old material that maybe has just been rehashed. So we're talking today, uh, in general, what I call the 360-degree leadership. 360-degree leaders. So uh, you will understand this as, we, as I show you some slides, and you can kind of visually see what I'm talking about. But what is a 360-degree leader? Well, first of all, it's important that we know that 360 degrees is what? One full circle, one full turn. That's 360 degrees. So if I say that we want to be 360 degree leaders, that means we want to be very well rounded. We want to be able to deal in every situation that we find, that we are confident and that we are able to be effective in whatever situation. Most People who consider themselves leaders are not 360-degree leaders. They might be 90-degree leaders, or they might be 180-degree leaders. But to be a full, well-rounded, balanced, well-experienced in all of these different areas that we'll cover today it is not common. So we want to be uncommon leaders. Amen? We want to be effective and leaders with excellence. And so... Uh, 360 degree leaders. Do you have, by the way, do you have the handouts? Good. Okay. Very good. I, I, I purposely did not leave too many blanks there for you because uh, I just didn't want you to be lost if we didn't have time. 
but hopefully it will make sense to you. So 360 degree leaders think differently. They approach things differently than leaders who are just confined to a linear, simplistic way of thinking. Thinking differentiates an effective leader from an ineffective leader. So may I just begin, this is a little bit of an introduction to the rest of the material we'll share, but I just want to share with you about the three different areas of thinking that distinguish a 360 degree leader. So we'll just call this 3D thinking or 360 degree thinking, all right? The way we think. So let's look at that together. You'll notice here that there's three different approaches to thinking, three different aspects of thinking. The way that we process, the way that we reflect, the way that our minds work as effective 360 degree leaders. You'll notice that there's three different types of thinking and your notes will highlight this in more detail. First of all is hindsight. Hindsight. Hindsight is learning from the past. Learning from the past. We'll just go ahead and uh, maybe I'll just fill these in and then explain each, all right? So hindsight is learning from the past, thinking back on what happened five years ago, 10 years ago, even 100 years ago, learning from others, historically. In the future, way out here on the right side of this directional arrow is foresight. Foresight. Foresight is what? It's perceiving or discerning the future. Future-minded leaders. Boy, there's not enough leaders today that have foresight, who can think ahead, who can anticipate what is coming next year. But wisdom and experience and learning the Lord enabling us to walk with wisdom will teach us how to have foresight, perceiving the future. Then lastly, the thinking that's right in the middle is called insight. So insight takes into account hindsight and it learns from foresight and it allows us to deal with issues with the wisdom of God in the present. Insight allows you to assess what's happening around you, your environment, the culture, the situation that you're in today. Insight will affect how you make decisions today. Insight will affect how you actually take the information that we equip you with today. It, you, if The more insight you have, the more you're going to be able to assimilate even the knowledge and the wisdom that we share today, the more insight you have. You have insight your insight is increased as your hindsight and your foresight are understood. All right, so let's back up. We'll fill in a few blanks on hindsight. Hindsight is what? Learning from the what? From the past. You know, it's interesting. There was a, a, a Greek god that was said to be the god of beginnings. And the name of that Greek god is Janus. What do we get that from? What do we get from that word? January. Yeah. So we get the English word January from actually from the Greeks who had a God that was supposed to be the God of transitions or the God of new things. Of course, we know that that's all idolatry. But anyway, I thought it might be interesting just to understand that uh, that even in times of old, even even those who just think secular realize that's that thinking about how things have happened and how we begin things looking back is important because whenever you see, for example, uh, an image of uh, the, the Greeks used to actually put Janus on some of their coins. And you would always know who the god of Janus was. And the reason was because Janus had two faces. Had a face, one face pointing this way, one face pointing that way. 
suggesting that when you enter a new season, when you start, you need to be able to be able to look back, but you also need to be able to look forward. How many of you know, usually at the beginning of the year, there's this sense in which we, we begin a new year. We want to think back over what happened in the previous year, but we also want to think forward as to what's happening this coming year. And so that is uh, the, the, the kind of similar to what I'm presenting in this idea of 3D thinking. So hindsight gives you power. It is power that comes from thinking intelligently and remembering what has happened in your past. People who totally overlook the lessons of the past are not wise people. All of us have been through experiences, key events in our life, particularly as Christians and as Christian leaders. Hopefully, we will recall important moments in time where God has intervened into our life, where we have learned important spiritual lessons, where we have learned from our own leadership mistakes and errors. We've learned from that, and because of that hindsight, we are wiser leaders today. You may recall how important this is from Scripture. Notice in the Old Testament in particular how that the Lord will instruct his people not to forget the past. For example, the children of Israel going through under the leadership of Joshua, they go through the Jordan River, right? They get to the other side of the Jordan, and what did God tell them to do? Go and place a monument of stones in the middle of the river, and he actually told them to go on, when you get to the other side of the Jordan, you go and put a pile of stones there. How many stones were piled up? Twelve, one for each tribe. And God gave them specific instructions and said, the reason that I'm having you build this monument of stones is so that you will not forget. And when you have children and you have grandchildren, you bring them to this place. You show them these 12 stones. You remind them how that I did a miracle here, how that I intervened and made a provision for your forefathers so that they could go from Jordan into the promised land. What was God doing? He was trying to demonstrate to the children and to the grandchildren and to future generations the importance of hindsight, remembering God's intervention, remembering it not only so it will create praise and rejoicing and thanksgiving, but also so we will learn lessons. Those who teach history will tell you that the value of history and knowing history is so that we do not repeat the mistakes of the past. Am I right? If you don't know anything about history, you'll make the same mistakes again. My father used to tell me, only a fool makes the mistake twice. A wise person will learn from other, others' mistakes. A student of history, particularly God's history, which sometimes we call it his story, history, can be a wise person because they have hindsight. We know even uh, there were other reasons throughout all of the Bible where God made sure that his people were remembering key events. The whole cause of the seven Jewish festivals. You know, the Jews had these consistent times of celebrating, right? Passover, Pentecost, the Feast of Tabernacles, and so on and so on. Did you know that every one of the seven Jewish feasts were connected to a historical event? Passover, right? What was the historical basis for Passover? The death angel passed over when they were still in Egypt, right? They painted door on the doorpost, the blood that came from the lamb that had been killed, one lamb from each family. And if they had the blood on the door, right? <coughs> death and the curse of death passed over them. 
the Lord instituted a feast, a celebration called Passover that was to recall, help them remember God's act and his faithfulness to them and how that they had been delivered out of the hands of the Egyptians. You see, the whole feast was about remembering. Even today, we celebrate wedding anniversaries, right? So when you celebrate a wedding anniversary, you're remembering. Like Carrie and I, many times, we've been married 47 years now, almost uh, pretty consistently when we have an anniversary. We'll, we'll reflect. Say, so do you remember? Do you remember this? Do you remember 10 years? Do you remember 20? Now, the older you get, you have a harder time doing some of this, all right? It takes a little bit more work. But, but the older you get, you still remember. I remember when we were engaged. Wow. You say, well, what's the value of that? Because it refreshes your love for one another, right? And so what is that? It's hindsight, the ability to look back with wisdom with remembrance, learning from the past. People who do not learn from the past are doomed to make mistakes in the present. The scripture says in Proverbs chapter 3 and in Proverbs chapter 4 that we need to value wisdom. In fact, we're to run after wisdom and treasure wisdom. We're to value wisdom more than silver and gold. More than valuable things, treasures today, we need to have a great appreciation for wisdom. How do we get wisdom? Wisdom comes primarily through experience. When I was a young pastor, I think maybe I'd been pastoring for five years, and I began pastoring. I went into full-time ministry when I was 18 years old. Some of you have sons and daughters, 18, and you're like, oh, I, I don't know that I could trust them. <laughs> God just drafted me, right? It was a very supernatural thing. But I went into full-time ministry when I was 18. So some of you say, wow, he's been in ministry for over 50 years. He must be really old. No, I just started very young. I just want to clarify that. <laughs> but you know what? The, uh, the, the, the lesson that I've learned is that wisdom is worth everything. And in my first five years, I was pastoring my first church, and uh, I was struggling. And uh, I pioneered a number of churches, and this, the very first church I pastored, I had started from a small prayer group. And so after about four or five years, I was struggling with the church, some different issues, and I went to a more experienced pastor who was in my city, and I sat down with him. I said, Dan, I need wisdom from you. I need to know what I'm missing. What are the mistakes that I'm making? Help me through this problem. And he was a very wise man. He was also a very quiet man. He didn't use a lot of words. He just sat there, and he looked at me. And paused for a moment. He said, I have the answer for you. I was attentive. I was sitting on the edge of my chair waiting for this great formula, ready to write down a new strategy. He said, you know what you need? He said, you just need some gray hair. I said, what? He said, you need gray hair. I was 25 years old, maybe 24 years old. And I had no gray hair at all. He said, you just need some gray hair. And I went, I just walked away thinking, well, that was useless. But do you know what he was saying? What you need is some wisdom that only will come through experience. Someone say amen. If you have gray hair, say amen real loud. <laughs> Y'all know what? I'm some of you are covering up your gray quite well, I must say. I, you can tell. My wife and I just decided... We want to let it all show. All right, all the gray, all the silver hair we have, we're going to let it show. So the point is, is that wisdom frequently only comes from experiences. But it's not just by being old that gives you wisdom. It's by learning to have hindsight. 
tapping into the experiences that you've had, evaluating them for what did we do right, what did we do wrong, what can we learn from that? That is hindsight. Okay, let's talk about foresight, and we'll come back to insight, all right? Then we have foresight. Foresight is perceiving the future. Now, this is, this is more challenging than hindsight because this requires you to actually have a discernment. And we'll look a little bit later at some scriptures that will kind of reinforce this. But perceiving the future involves you being able to almost have <clears throat> what I would call a prophetic perception, a prophetic look, tuning your eyes and your spiritual ears into what's going on and being able to understand what, what's coming, what is likely coming. It's interesting. Uh, I have a friend who several years ago in the year and a half prior to Donald Trump becoming the president in my country, so this is one administration before the current administration, you, you probably don't know because, you know, you have your own political situations here that's involved. You have so much going on, you don't have time to be involved in American politics. But no one expected Donald Trump to be the next president of the United States. No one expected it. Everyone had a different prediction about most of the pundits, the political pundits. But I have a friend of mine, along with there were two other voices. There were three prophetic voices, Christians in our country, who actually were bold enough to write out a prophetic prediction. And my friend, who's quite a well-known speaker, uh, it's quite controversial, but he's also very well-known, wrote a book predicting, showing a dream and a vision that God gave him about Donald Trump being the president. At the time, he was treated like a false prophet. I can't believe that you would put your whole ministry at risk like that. But he wrote a book predicting it, and guess what? It was true. Of course, as a result of that, he became very famous because, you know, he was right. If he would have been wrong, he would have been stoned. But instead, he was promoted. The point is he had the ability to perceive. He saw something that was coming. He saw prophetically what God had in mind. The ability to have foresight involves not only intuition, perception, but even it involves um, a spirit of faith. You having faith for what God wants to do in the future. So when you have foresight, I believe that we need to look ahead with eyes of faith. We need to look ahead as far as our own families, as far as our church, as far as our own leadership with the eyes of faith of what God wants to do in your life. Foresight uh, is a quality that many leaders don't work on. But I find that having foresight is important. Let me see if I can illustrate. In churches, we deal with, uh, a lot of people don't understand this, but you as leaders will understand, a church is not a business, but it must be run like a business. It must be run according to good, solid, financial, business principles. But there is a little bit of a challenge with churches when it comes to the financial realm. In most businesses, you have enough historical data and enough basis that you can make projections and forecasts of the next year of how much revenue you're going to make because you know how many salespeople you have, you know this, you know what campaigns you have, blah, 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 blah. In churches, how do you set a budget for the following year? Because you have no way of knowing. In a church, you have no way of actually predicting how much tithes and offerings are going to be in that church. Why? You ought to know by now because Christians can be quite fickle. Christians will come. Christians will go. 
They will decide that this is their church for this month. And next month, they'll say, oh, there's something over here. Oh, that's, that's shiny. That looks impressive. Oh, I want to go over there. So how does a church have any kind of solid, solid, verifiable forecasting data? It requires foresight. Now, there's some skills that you develop for doing it, and uh, you can try to predict revenue, but I found that doing financial projections for churches requires a mixture of both wisdom but also faith. It's always a faith projection. And you have to project, and you can be conservative, but you can also be conservative with faith and have a number. And then, uh, and then you base your spending, of course, on that. So my point is foresight is a valuable tool. All right, so if you have hindsight, it's the ability to look from the past, learn from the past. You have foresight, which is the ability to perceive the future then you can actually have a very valuable means of having insight. Insight is for today. Insight is how you're going to deal with the issues and the challenges that are going to face you as a leader today. It is assessing the present, and it is based on a keen awareness of what you've learned from the past, what you're perceiving for the future. And it always will include uh, what, what I call contextual variables. Contextual variables. We'll look at this in a moment in one of our specific kinds of multiple intelligence. But a contextual variable are there are things going on in your context. How many of you would agree that during the pandemic we had a contextual variable? <laughs> yeah. Big time. A contextual variable that changed things that were going on around you. Changed your insight about what to do and how to do it. So in every life, in every organization, you must have insight. If you will add hindsight and foresight and insight together, you will have a leader who thinks uniquely, and it will make them effective, very effective. All right. I want to go to the next section. Are there any quick questions about this before I, uh, before I go on? Come on now. I was doing good before. I don't seem to be having success in a direct way. You're going to help me. There we go. Oh, yeah, let me go back to that other slide very quickly. Just want to show you this before I get to the next section. So what I've done is I've taken the 3D thinking so you'll see that there is the past, the future, and the present. And I just wanted to show you how they overlap. And it becomes what we call the triad, the triad of 3D thinking. So they aren't just distinct from one another, but they actually affect one another. And you can imagine if somehow we can live right there in the overlap of those circles in that interior vector, that's where we'll really be 3D thinkers, and it will bring us great, great success. Okay, and by the way, I don't mind if these slides that I have, because, because we're going to be going quite rapidly over some material, I sure don't mind if those are distributed to those groups here. You're more than welcome to them, all right? All right, I want to take a dive. Before we take a dive into this new section, any questions about 3D thinking? Yes, Dan. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Um, my question is it borders on um, thinking as a church leader, thinking business-wise. Um, how do we draw the line? How do we come to the place where we don't overthink it? Because um, s slipping straight into it will cause the church to lose its vision and then becomes business. So um, the two goes together. How do we? That is very accurate. And my answer is it's, it's not either or. It's both and. So using good business principles is helpful, informative, but you must mix it with hearing from God, a spirit of faith, having a biblical mindset, 
So, for example, many times business, I have a situation going on right now. We have purchased land to build a building. We have been saving money and believing God to do this. We have all the architectural plans, everything done, but we have not yet decided to start because we've been watching the economy. So we're smart enough business people to go, what's going on around us? How should that affect us? We're looking at property values. So we're taking all that into consideration. But right now, I and the elders are waiting. We're poised to make the decision to start building. But we're waiting to hear from the Lord. So we're blending the, the ability to be a spiritual-minded leader along with taking into account the economic situations, the variables that are going around us. So it's both and. It's, and they're both very, very useful. Most of the time you find churches, uh, church leaders who are either totally on the business natural arena and they make every decision based on just business approaches or you find them being over here just super spiritual and they, they ignore business principles that are very important. So I think it's the balance between them. Does that help? Maybe time for one more question on this section before we move on. Anyone else? Question? Yes, right here. You're going to help her with the microphone? Very good. Thank you. My question is, uh, how do we gain wisdom or what environment do we create for people to assess wisdom? Yeah. Good. To move forward. I would just add a few things. Number one, make the word of God priority because God's wisdom comes from God's word. Number two, value people's experience. Spend time with people who are mature, who are older than you, who have been doing it longer than you. Um, I remember hearing John Maxwell say that in his early years of leadership, he went to a very well-known leader and he said, may I pay you $100? I'll pay you $100 if you'll give me 30 minutes of your time. He was willing to pay him $100 for 30 minutes of his time because he realized what? That that person had wisdom and he was willing to pay for his time. But he just wanted to draw that wisdom from him. So spend time, look for sources of wisdom. Those are people who have been successful, but also people who have made mistakes and that you can learn and draw from. I find in the local church, uh, unfortunately, some churches, when people get to a certain age, they be, they kind of push them over to the side and they think that they're uh, no longer consequential. But I believe the Bible teaches us that we ought to have respect for those that are our elders. And so learning to draw from them, they may, may not be as active as they once were, but they have a lot of wisdom and we can glean from them. Does that help? Okay, let's go to the next section if we can. All right, y'all strap in. I want to take you down a path that's some things that you may not have known before. And I want to give you the big picture. And then I'm going to hone in on a few of these areas that I believe we'll, we'll have time to get into. All right? So keeping, keeping an eye on my time and making sure that we have time for some good questions and answers. A number of years ago, there was a, uh, a theorist in psychology and sociology named Gardner. His last name was Gardner. He developed a theory called the theory of multiple intelligences. The theory of multiple intelligences. Now, the way he approached it was, it was for educators to try to help educators learn that education is not just about natural intelligence that's related to someone's intellectual ability. But he tried to help educators understand that there was different types of intelligence. That certain students would have natural abilities. For example, uh, he had one intelligence that he would call uh, an artistic intelligence. That there were some of students who would have a natural bent towards being artistic and creative. But they might not have strong math ability. It was just an, an issue of the way that they were built and wired. Uh, one of my granddaughters 
is incredibly gifted musically. She's only 13. She, see, just turning 13 right now. Yeah, this next month will turn 13. She can literally, her, her, her other grandfather taught her the basics of playing a bass guitar when she was five or six. Since then, she has learned probably five or six instruments. She's 13. She literally, when she began school this year, she said, you know, I think I want to learn another instrument. So her parents said, well, what instrument do you want to learn? She said, mm, I think the saxophone. So she picked up the saxophone, and before her first class, she could already play music on her saxophone. She became frustrated in her music class because none of the other students could make a noise on the instrument. She could already play a song. She had mastered, not mastered totally, but she knew how to play her saxophone. What was that? It's just something. There was a musical, artistic ability. It wasn't because of training. It was just a part. It was an intelligence that she had. So the gardener's point was we have to help people learn, not just with a singular intelligence. And if we understand that there are a multiplicity of intelligences, it will help us to equip and develop people better. So that caused me to begin to reflect. And I thought, you know, it is really true, particularly for us as spiritual leaders, and, and I have, as, as Pastor Kingsley mentioned to you, my area of study has been for, for uh, almost 30 years now, leadership studies. So I've spent a lot of time thinking, reflecting, studying, reading, and writing about leaders and how leaders think and how leaders operate more effectively. And so I arrived at this conclusion uh, a year or two ago, and I've never taught this per se. So what I'm going to teach you right now is, is, a, little bit, is a little bit new from teaching it, but I, I have confidence that it will help you. So what... Uh, we've been talking about these 360-degree leaders. A 360-degree leader is a leader not only who thinks differently, but it is a leader who taps into what I call multiple intelligences. Multiple intelligences. Now, every one of these intelligences, and I have a list of them here on the screen for you, they'll also be included in your notes. These intelligences are actually, each of them are leadership competencies. They are competencies that leaders should work at developing. In fact, I believe that all seven of these intelligences are critical to be the best possible leader. As I mentioned to you, intelligence used to be measured as a singular ability. So all of us have heard the word IQ, right? What is your IQ? That means your what? Your intellectual quotient. L literally, your, your, your brain power, your intellectual quotient. Um, and that could be measured. They found out ways to try to measure that. But that would be, used to be uh, 50 years ago, Someone's IQ was the only thing that universities looked at as far as accepting new students. They said, well, what is their IQ? What is their score on this particular uh, measurement, metric? Then universities even began to learn, okay, someone may have a very poor IQ, but they may be very intelligent. Because why? There's all different kinds of intelligences. And so we refer to this as MI. Multiple intelligence. And if we can learn to develop multiple intelligences, it will increase the leader's performance. It will raise the levels effect, the level of effectiveness, regardless of the context. Even in the midst of, for example, trying to figure out how to lead an organization or a business or a church in a post-COVID environment. That's challenging. That is quite challenging. So I was comparing notes with Pastor Amosa yesterday. And I find I found that many of the challenges and the dilemmas of leading churches 
today in a post-COVID environment in America is very, some of these are very similar to what you're facing. So that some of the statistics and some of the trends that we're finding are quite similar. So uh, many of these intelligences help us to become agile, adaptive leaders, where we're not just stuck in doing things the way we've always done them. All of a sudden, we're thrown in the middle of a, a pandemic. Most of us have never lived through a pandemic like that ever before in our lives. I have never led a church through a more difficult, challenging time in all of my 50 years, never before. But boy, have I learned some things over the past few years. So I wanted to pack into this teaching, give you the concept, and then I'm going to deal with several of these. So let's just review all seven for a moment, and then I'm going to tell you those that I'm going to teach on. So from the top, um, there is biblical intelligence, and th these are going to be in your notes in a different, in a different uh, list. So first of all is biblical intelligence. That has to do with how much Bible knowledge we have, knowing the Word of God. Number two is situational intelligence. Situational intelligence. I'll be explaining that in a little bit, but it has to do with learning to deal in different situations, in different moments with different people, you learn the situation and you adjust your leadership accordingly. Number three, emotional intelligence. Uh, sometimes we call this EQ, your emotional quotient. Emotional intelligence uh, was a concept that was developed to talk to us about how we feel about a situation learning to be sensitive to how other people listen, relate to us socially, understanding uh, how to work with people better. We'll get into that a little bit today. Number four, contextual intelligence. Contextual intelligence. We'll look at this again. This teaches us how to look at the context that we're in and make decisions, leadership decisions, based upon our context so we're not out of touch with the context. Number five is what we just talked about. The old typical standard IQ is your intellectual quotient. This is a certain kind of intelligence. We will not be spending, we'll not be spending time on number six. Uh, I'm sorry, number five. Number six, we won't have time for because I figured out of all of these, you probably know more about this already, but I want you to understand that it is one of our intelligences. I know people who have a high IQ, but they don't know anything about the Spirit of God. They don't have any, they may even be really high, score really high in biblical literacy, but their spiritual literacy is low. You know what I mean? They don't have the ability to discern. They don't have the ability to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. They, they, they don't even take it into consideration. They're all about what the Bible says, but they don't have a spiritual intelligence. Number seven is financial intelligence. It's a really important. If you're going to make it in today's world, you better have some financial intelligence to be a good steward, whether you are just barely have enough money to pay your bills or whether you are developing wealth. Regardless, we need financial intelligence. And I think even as a church, we need to feel responsible to help people develop financial intelligence. All right. All seven of those intelligences are valid and valuable. I believe that if we can develop all seven, develop ourselves in all seven areas of intelligence, we will be a 360 degree leader. But for the sake of time today, I've only selected some of these. So I'm going to talk briefly about biblical intelligence. I'm going to talk about situational intelligence, emotional intelligence, and contextual intelligence. All right. So spend our remaining time here uh, with those. And I think I have about probably an hour and a half of instruction, and we'll have Q&A for the rest of the time, all right? And, um, and I think we're probably due for a break some point here this morning as well. Everybody good? Here we go. 
Let's talk about, um, let's start with biblical intelligence. This will be the most familiar to you. Let me make some statements about it. I don't think I'm going to have to convince you too strongly on this, but I think it is important. Biblical intelligence. I believe we're living in a day in which biblical literacy is critical. You would be shocked. I'm going to give you some statistics. Maybe they won't shock you at all. But we have a problem today with people having biblical literacy. What is biblical literacy? It is having a basic knowledge of the Bible that comes from reading Scripture. I'm not even talking about you knowing theology. I'm just talking about basic biblical literacy. Are you literate when it comes to the Bible? Do you understand something about the Bible in general? Have you read through Scripture? How much time do you spend reading the Bible? We find ourselves living in societies that are biblically illiterate. Yes, we have a, a, a literacy issue with people just knowing how to read, right? That's an issue. Even in Western countries, it's a shocking statistics about just regular literacy. People unable to read. They're 21 years old and they still don't know how to read. But more critical than that is the problem with biblical illiteracy. Let me give you statistics. In Britain, I'm going to read this directly from the source that I found. I'll read this exactly. In Britain, engagement with the Bible among those who say that they are Christians. Okay, so this uh, might be different. Among Christians was Overall, the numbers of those who are biblically literate, the older, the more literate. The younger, the less literate. So millennials, for example, in general, was lower than those who were older. I think you could have probably predicted that, right? But only around 49% of Christians, listen to this, 49%, so less than half of all Christians in Britain, say that they read any part of the Bible in a month. And included in that survey was if they happened to be in a funeral and there was a Bible verse used, or if they were in a wedding and they read the verse that was associated with the wedding ceremony, that counted as reading their Bible. Now, we all understand that's not real Bible reading, is it? But I just want you to know how this survey was done, all right? 9%, 9% of Christians who said that they were practicing Christians, which meant that they go to church regularly and blah, 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 blah. 9% of practicing Christians in Britain said that they read the Bible daily. 13% said maybe a few times a week they'll read a verse or more. And 17% said that they read the Bible a few times in a whole year. 17% of practicing Christians said they'll actually take the time several times in a year to read, the, read some of the Bible. Meaning the result is this that 51% of practicing Christians read it less than once a month. Over half of the practicing Christians in Britain will read the Bible less than once a month. I'm not, I didn't say read the Bible all the way through. I'm just about reading anything in the Bible. Reading a psalm. Reading a Bible verse. So what does this result in? It results in people, even in our churches, that are biblically illiterate. Who don't know enough of the Bible. And who are purely reliant upon 
those that are preaching and teaching the word of God to tell them anything, anything at all. It's based on whatever they hear publicly. And let's be honest, some in some churches where people claim that they're hearing the Bible, the teaching is not sound. It's just truth. Um, just so you know that the problem is not isolated to Britain. I could give you the statistics on America, but it's all depressing. Okay. So a third of Americans never, ever read the Bible on their own. One third of practicing Christians in America. So um, the result of this is Christians, whether it be Britain, America, wherever, Christians have a lack of understanding of truth and very minimal understanding of biblical doctrine. So let me explain how this affects our the way we live. So let's we want to we want to take this down to a granular level. So how does this really affect us? Is it that big a deal? Yeah, this is this is what happens. Fewer than half of the population say that the Bible is 100% accurate. No, I'm sorry. That's fewer than half of the practicing Christians. Fewer than half, 47% of Christians say that the Bible is 100% accurate. Half say that the Bible is written for everybody just to interpret the way that he or she chooses. 75% disagree with the idea that even the smallest sin deserves eternal consequences. 77% say that people must contribute their own effort in order to be saved. May I repeat that? Now, you're good Baptists. You should know better. 77% believe you're basically earning your own salvation through personal effort. Half, 52%, say good deeds will help them earn a spot in heaven. 45% believe that there's many different ways to get to heaven. 45%. So what's the point? Biblical illiteracy results in people viewing life, viewing culture without what we call a biblical worldview. The lens, the glasses that they're looking through when they're making judgments about things like abortion, things like gender confusion, things like decisions your government is making, things like what to watch and listen to in the media and entertainment. All of those things are what circle people every day but biblical illiteracy has messed with us to the point that people are not viewing that through the lens of truth anymore. They're making decisions based on how they feel or what their friends say or what their social media posts reflect. Can I hear an amen from anyone? This is what is happening to society. And I believe that the reason is because of the absence of a grasp of the word of God. Only the word of God. Thank God that y'all chose to make the word of God your theme for this year. Only the word of God can teach us, train us to have a worldview that integrates all decision making based upon the truth of God's word. It's not based on how you feel. It's not based on the opinion of other people. It's not based on what the anchor of some BBC program conveyed. It's based upon the truth of Scripture. And if we lose our biblical literacy, and if the next generations lose biblical literacy, I assure you it will affect not only society, but it will affect our churches. What does Jesus say? Matthew 4, 4. 
Man shall not live by physical food alone, but by every word that comes out of God's mouth. Surely, we need to study, know, and apply the word of God together. Now, let me just offer this other insight. Studies have been done to show that discipleship and Christian growth happen best when people are studying and applying God's word together in a community. That supports the idea of having small groups of some kind, a discipleship group or a Bible study group or group settings, group context, help Christians to study and learn better. They do it better together in groups. They will grow as disciples better as a group. Living together in community with other believers. I think I have this in your notes, written by Eric, Ed Stetzer and Eric Geiger, great, great authors. Living in community with other believers, wrestling through real issues, embracing the gospel together, reminding one another of our identity in Christ is God's transformative platform. You want to be transformed? You want to make sure that other people are being transformed? You've got to live and wrestle through the truth of Scripture together as a group. I'm sure you've done it before, but we have this year... You know, January is always a time of prayer and fasting for us in, in our churches. And uh, we decided to develop a lot of resources. So we have a, a page, a landing page on our website where there are resources to show people, here is a resource for you doing daily prayer and how to share prayer needs with one another. Apps that are available for your smart device that allow you to have things that support your intercessory prayer. Uh, we've challenged everybody to have what we call uh, your top three for 2023, where everyone is choosing three people to intercede for and pray for on a daily basis through the entire year of 2023. We have tools that support that. We, we have daily Bible reading plans, an abundance of different kinds. We are challenging people to go deeper into the Word of God more than they ever have, challenging everyone to have a Bible plan. We're not, you know, obviously it would be great if everybody would read the Bible through in a year. But how many of you know that's, that can, once you get, you know, through Leviticus, you feel like you're done. Anybody ever been there? You're like, you get through Leviticus, you're like, Jesus, help me now. Oh, <laughs> I think maybe I know enough already. I, I'm going to pause. And multiple chapters, reading multiple chapters a day can be quite a challenge, right? But the, po the point is, we've got to help even the youngest believer to start learning to read, to consume more of the Bible. And once they're consuming more of the Bible, we can then help them learn some basics. So we want everybody to be discipled. So we, we use a 10-week, everyone does it differently. I don't care how you do it. We use a 10-week program for new believers or what we call renewed believers where they have a work for they work through for 10 weeks and they meet together with a discipler every week they meet face to face for one hour and they're going through those basics together making sure that the foundations are there because when it comes to discipleship there's two kinds of discipleship there's foundational discipleship and formational discipleship foundational discipleship or laying the groundwork, laying the ABCs, putting the basic foundations in place to allow a believer to have them. And we'd be, you, you and I would be shocked to know how few people have foundations. They don't even have the basics. And then on top of that is formational discipleship. That's what every one of us will always hopefully be engaged in formational discipleship. That's the process, the journey of becoming more like Jesus. And we should be in that process for the rest of our lives. Amen? Foundational and formational. The church should have a plan, I believe. The church ought to have a plan and a strategy for both. How do we help people in their foundational discipleship? How are we going to ensure that all the believers are growing and on their journey of growing together? 
Bible literacy is the, is the taproot for this. What we must develop, I'll say this, we'll, we'll get ready to take a question and we'll go to the next intelligence. We need to develop disciples who are self-feeders. Do you know, understand what I mean by self-feeder? As opposed to disciples who are dependent, codependent upon their favorite television pastor, to feed them, preach to them, inspire them, make them feel good. Because that's the most that some people ever get. That's it. We've got to train people to read the Bible for themselves. We've got to train people to feed themselves. I'm not against apostles and prophets and pastors and evangelists and teachers. I'm all for that. Yes, we need the public instruction of God's word. We need that. But we also have to have people that are like the Bereans in the book of Acts who are able to discern, am I hearing truth or am I hearing false doctrine? And the only way they can know that is if they have self-fed. Biblical intelligence. I think it's important not only for leaders, it's important for all disciples. But for leaders, it's absolutely non-negotiable. How is your biblical intelligence? All right, a moment for one or two quick questions or comments, and we'll proceed with the next kind of intelligence. Anyone on this important subject? I know I'm, as we say, preaching to the choir right now. Anyone? No questions on biblical intelligence? All right, right back here. There's one here. There's one there. Yeah, there you go. He's passing the mic. Thank you, Dr. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, regarding a 10-week um, membership system we have in your church, mm. um, can you briefly lay it out for us? And how, how is it related to the um, the foundation of Bible literacy? Can you briefly give us Yeah, we use a workbook. You know, there's many tools available. We use a workbook that, that has 10 weeks of study. It deals with the basics. What is the Bible? What is prayer? Fellowship? You know, just the basics. And it goes through where the, where the disciple is doing, reading some scriptures, filling in some blanks in his or her workbook. And then they meet with their discipler to review, to ask questions, to pray for one another. And then they go to the next chapter. And they have 10 chapters of that. And they meet for 10 weeks, one hour for each week. Um, we find that that is realistic for people. From a time standpoint, it's realistic. Uh, some people uh, do it even um, uh, using, uh, say, FaceTime or some other, if, if they can't actually be in the presence of one. There's, we're blessed with a lot of different ways to do this, right? And... Uh, but they meet together. It's very easy because it's 10 weeks. That's 10 hours. It's very easy for us to recruit disciplers. So we have 55 disciplers who are trained. So the moment someone comes to Christ or the moment someone rededicates their life to Christ, immediately we, we match them with a discipler, men to men, women to women. So we match them with a discipler and we put them on a track to begin to meet every week. For those 10 weeks. That, that's how that works for us. Does that help? Yeah. I, I, please don't understand. I'm not advocating you adopt our, our method. There's a lot of different ways to do it. But the point is pay attention to foundational discipleship. Yes, sir. One more question here. Thank you, Dr. Bogey. Um, I just want to ask a question on how do or how can one develop a sound biblical literacy, given that there are so many versions of the Bible now. And these versions always tend to pose a, a kind of confusion. I don't know whether it's the right word to use. Um, so there are different interpretations. And for, for example, we use the study Bible. But there are different study Bibles who will give you different perspectives to the, to the word. King James is a very 
this goal went to under ten didn't oh, it? Oh, of course. I, I'll just make a couple of questions. I, I don't I don't believe this should be too difficult. Uh, number one, just on your last point to that point, let's understand what's inspired and what isn't. Study notes are not inspired. They're someone's interpretation and view. It might be just like reading a commentary. You know, just because they're in a study Bible doesn't mean that they're written by the Holy Spirit. As far as translations, yes, we have to just understand, help people understand, that, and usually it's it's based upon, you know, the pastor's choices in that church because different ones of us maybe have preferences for different translations. I, I use different translations depending upon depending upon the message and what I'm trying to communicate. But but there are certain translations that are uh, more accurate can I use this word, hermeneutically, in terms of the actual interpretation from the original text, there are some translations that are more accurate word for word. And then there are some translations that are for what we call readability. They might be a paraphrase. It might be just, it flows better. It might be because the language is more modern. Uh, so, for example, New American Standard, uh, ESV, uh, even the New Living Translation are incredibly accurate. But like, for example, the New American Standard can be a little bit wooden, stiff. Whereas if you read out of uh, a translation um, uh, that, that's maybe more of a paraphrase, like a lot of Christians today like the Message Bible. Well, there, I don't have a problem with someone reading the Message Bible. Just under, when you're down to the point of trying to figure out your doctrinal theological beliefs, don't use the Message Bible to do that. Because it's a paraphrase. It's a Eugene Peterson was a great gift to the body of Christ, but just know it for what it is. Um, some people like the Passion. There's a lot of controversy right now about the Passion Bible being some issues with it. I won't get into all that. But the point is, know what are the real, reliable, most accurate texts. Listen to what your pastor says on that and stay within that. And if you want to read a different translation uh, for the sake of readability, just for inspiration and readability, it's fine. But when you're really basing your viewpoints and your doctrine and theology on things, go with the, the texts that are more accurate. When you're really in a serious Bible study, go with the more accurate texts. So does that help a little bit? Yeah, okay, very good. Pastor, did I? Do okay on that? You want to make a comment? Th thanks so much, Pastor Bobby. Excellent. Uh, under biblical literacy, the, I believe that one of the challenges of our age is where people have memorized scriptures. And uh, at times decide to show off. And uh, some of the quotations they will quote is totally out of uh, uh, context in terms of what they are saying. And people think that it's biblical. Yeah. So, so thanks, thanks so much, Pastor Bobby. And Elder, you know that uh, here our main uh, Bible translation is a New King James. And the NIV before uh, 2000, because the after 2000, the translations have been watered down. It's been very important. Thank you. Good. I knew you would give a good direction on that. Okay, let's shift gears, can we? All right, trying to get a few more things in before we get to a, a, a break point. Let's talk about, I don't think this is the same order as you have. Let's jump to a second. We'll, we'll stick with your notes. Emotional intelligence. All right, emotional intelligence. What in the world is emotional intelligence? I gave a definition here that will help you. Emotional intelligence is the ability to manage both your own emotions and understand the emotions of people around you. How many of you are familiar with Daniel Goldman's original seminal writings about emotional intelligence, maybe in your uh, university work or maybe in your field uh, that you're in in your career. How many of you are familiar with what we call EQ? You're familiar with that. Anybody here? Can I remember? Okay. 
Okay, so just a handful of you, all right? So Daniel Goleman, G-O-L-E-M-A-N, wrote the seminal work on emotional intelligence. Um, I don't agree with everything he said, but anyway, it's, it's based upon his study, his research, and it's a very useful tool. Because emotional intelligence is one of the multiple intelligences that we're studying. But this intelligence has to do with you being, number one, in touch with yourself and your own feelings and understanding people. <laughs> I, I know leaders who, who really are very low in their EQ. Their emotional intelligence is very low. Because they don't care about people. They don't care what other people think. They don't care how other people are feeling. If you're leading a small group, for example, and you don't have any emotional intelligence, you, there might be something going on under the surface in the group with people and how they're reacting and responding, and you're not in touch with it. If you have a higher emotional intelligence, you pick up on that. People with high emotional intelligence can read people. They discern. Re people's reactions, body language. They're in touch with people. They're also in touch with themselves. They have a deep, what we call a self-awareness. Some people are totally blind to what's going on with themselves. They have no self-awareness. They're only thinking about this or that. But an emotionally intelligent person is not only self-aware, but also aware of those in, that they're around and those that they're influencing. Self-awareness can make or break a leader. I've given you some signs. I don't think I'll let these blank. I've given you five signs of what we call a developed emotional intelligence. Someone who has a high emotional intelligence is likely to show these five signs. First one, self-awareness of feelings. You know, I, I'm surprised uh, frequently by how we have suppressed the emotional realm. We have become so in the Western world, we have become so intellectual that we've really put a cap on emotions and we don't give credit to the emotional side. And, and God has built us to be emotional people. So just as a reminder, how God has made us, the Bible tells us that we have been created like God as a three-part being. Sometimes we use the word tripartite, just like God. Uh, Thessalonians talks about us being, may, may you be sanctified or made whole. Spirit, soul, and body. Those are the three parts of man. That's the way God has created us to be. Just by review, you understand what the body is. That's the physical part of our being, right? The flesh, the physical part. The soul is made up of three things. Your soul is made up of your mind, your emotions, and your will. Your mind, your will, and your emotions. The mind being the intellect, the will being the volitional part of you that makes decisions. The emotion is obviously the, the affective part of you. And then, of course, we have the spirit of man. The spirit of man, the Bible tells us that sin, this was the part of you that was created to be God conscious. This soul part of you, the Greek word is the word suke, where we get psychological Suke, this part of you, the soul, is the self-conscious part of you. This body is the world-conscious. That's where you connect with the world around you. So you have the God-conscious part of you, self-conscious part of you, the world-conscious part of you. God created you to be conscious of him. Adam was created to be conscious of God. His spirit was in direct communion with God. But when sin entered the world, the spirit was cut off from God. The spirit was cut off from God, and the spirit became dormant in man. That's why in Ephesians chapter 2, it says we were dead in sin. This was the part of us that was dead. 
So after sin entered the world, the condition of man was dead spiritually, cut off from God, separated from God. We were dead spiritually. But man was mentally, emotionally, in their soulish realm, active, developing, and of course, physically alive, breathing. But what happened in the sinful state is man began to be learned, learned how to be dominated and directed by this part, by the soul, and influenced by the flesh, by the body. So then we have Jesus comes along. He comes along to what? To restore us. And he saved us from our sin. Dead in sins and trespasses, Ephesians chapter 2. Then it goes on to say, but God, but God, he, came, he intervened. And what God did is he provided the Holy Spirit and salvation to reconnect us to God at a spiritual level. We were spiritually dead. And when we're born again, regenerated, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, praise God, the Holy Spirit comes and regenerates this dead, dormant spirit, and it comes alive, renewed, alive to God. Used to be dead unto God, dead into sin, dead in sin. Now, alive unto God, and this part of us now is regenerated. And this inner part of us, the spirit part of us, God now wants us to be dominated and led by that spirit man. Because your spirit man used to be just the human spirit. Now it is joined with the Holy Spirit. Regenerated. That is the part of you where you can learn to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. That's the part of you God wants to dominate your life. So the process now of the spirit taking control over mind, emotion, and will, this over the soul, how many of you know that's not always easy? That's your daily life of sanctification, becoming more and more like Jesus. So the more control we give to the Holy Spirit, Paul said, put off the old man, put on the new man. Don't walk in the sins of the past. But when we renewed in the spirit, what he's saying is, let your life be dictated by this part of you, that inner part of you, no longer by the soul or the body. So it takes time and spiritual growth for the spirit to take over your mind. We call that the renewing of the mind. For it to take over the will so that we can say like Jesus, not my will, but yours be done, Father. So it can literally control even your emotional realm. Emotions include things like out-of-control emotions like weeping, grieving, crying, happiness, feelings of being excited, emotions. God made us as emotional creatures. But we need to learn to have our emotions controlled by the Holy Spirit. If you have an emotional person not controlled by the Holy Spirit, they can commit murder. Rage. But you have a Christian whose emotions are controlled by the Holy Spirit. We can sense the flow of God's emotion. When he's feeling, when he's mourning, when he's experiencing great delight. Most Christians are not in touch at all with that emotional stuff. In fact, in Western countries, we're taught to suppress it. What do we do? We exalt the mental side, but we suppress the emotional side. So I think God, uh, there's some, been some great stuff that's been written recently on uh, a spiritually, uh, an emotionally healthy Christian. The Emotionally Healthy Leader, there's one called the Emotionally Healthy uh, Christian, Emotionally Healthy Christianity, all really, really good things. But he's talking about Christians getting in touch with that emotional side and not only becoming mature just as people of God, 
but emotionally mature. Because many Christians are being held back because their emotions are so wrecked, wounded, traumatized, and they're not emotionally healthy. All right, so we're talking about emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence has to do with self-awareness, but also not only being in touch with what's going on in here, but also being in touch with those who are around you. So if you're emotionally intelligent, you're a better leader. It's one of the things I, I find in my personal mentoring of emerging leaders that we have to work on the most is helping their emotional intelligence. Have you ever met someone, let's see if I can use other language, uh, who you watch their conversations and they have no filters? Do you know what I'm talking about? No filters. In other words, they just say, they'll say anything. And they're not conscious of, of how Sly would respond, how Steve would feel. They're not ever thinking of that. They're just, it's wide open. There are no filters going on. That's someone who has no filters is emotionally low, 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 low on the emotional intelligence scale. So we all need to learn how to be emotionally intelligent and more in touch. Now, I have just scraped the surface of emotional intelligence, all right? But uh, let me just take a moment in case someone has a question or maybe you have a clarifying comment. Uh, I, I welcome that on this subject of emotional intelligence for a moment. Anyone? There may be some. Here, go ahead, sir. On the topic of emotional intelligence, would you say that a leader who does not exhibit emotional intelligence should be in a place of leadership or not? Yeah, it depends. It depends on how severe it is because all of these are areas of growth that we grow in. So none of us are perfect in, in emotional intelligence. But if you have someone that is absent of any emotional intelligence, then you better be careful who they lead because it'll get you in trouble real quick. They'll usually, what will happen if you put a leader who is really low in emotional intelligence in a, po in a place of position influence, they'll offend people. Conflict will be very normal. You end up with tension. Then the pastor has all these meetings because you're trying to clear up the mess. That's what happens usually. And the person who is the person who's not emotionally intelligent, they're clueless. Huh? They're unaware. And usually it's a real surprise to them of like, really? I, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that for that person to feel that way. So I would say caution should be used. But remember, none of us are none of us are fully mature in that area. All of us are growing. But just be careful that the person is has some level of, of EQ. Is there another question on this subject? There might be someone here who's an expert who can help us. Anyone else? Over here, yes. Oh, yeah. I just want to just uh, ask, uh, how do we support somebody who have haven't got emotional intelligence? How do we support the person? Yeah, or maybe anyone. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> these are the signs. I didn't go through them all. Self-awareness of feelings, gets along with others, present, focused, adept at working with others, and operates with integrity. I think mentoring and coaching are key supportive environments. Um, this is emotional intelligence, I find, is difficult to read a chapter of a book and to get emotional intelligence because it is usually learned in the context of relationships. So you don't usually know how self-aware you are until you put you into a situation where you can see how you respond and react to the people. You don't know how sensitive you are to adapt to the environment. You just don't know. So I think small group settings with someone who is more mature and who can ha help point out. Um, uh, I'm just thinking of a couple of good books on the, su on the subject matter. Um, there's a great book by called The Servant, and then there's a sequel called The Culture, 
written by a man named Hunter. His last name is Hunter. Uh, it's, they're easy reads because he, he, it's, 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 it's not a true story. It's written as a story uh, that is supposed to lend insight. And so you find them meeting in a small group, these different professionals leading. Uh, so you have a coach and a teacher and a, this, a pastor and these different people. And you have the moderator who is uh, in the story. He's actually a, um, a monk. He used to be a CEO of a corporation, and, and now he's a monk. So he's advising the group, and the group is interacting, and they're having these arguments and discussions, and the, the mentor is helping them to mature, to grow. So what he's doing, he's saying, now, wait a minute. Did you, did you just see what you just said? What you just said was highly offensive to Jane. So that kind of a healthy group setting where the boundaries are clear and there's, there's a sense of safety in that group. Uh, like I have, a, I have a group. I've always done this for 40 years. So I have a mentoring group of emerging leaders that I meet with consistently. Every other week I meet with them. We, we're usually reading material together, and then we compare notes together. And in those meetings, we have kind of a social contract with one another, which means we can say we can say anything and we understand that we can trust one another and we love each other and it's a safe place but there are many times that someone says something that's completely unintelligent when it comes to emotional intelligence and i'll say wait a minute stop the group did y'all see what just happened here and by them seeing it experiencing it having someone that will challenge it in love helps them to kind of check and say, wow, I, I didn't realize. I wasn't aware. So I don't know. Those kinds of groups or environments in some kind with, with healthy, good, mature coaching and mentoring, I think is a great way to develop uh, emotional intelligence, as it is some of these other areas, but particularly in that area. Because it's emotional intelligence is something that we kind of hide. We, we hide it. We're in denial about it. We're unaware of it. So it's something that has to other people have to pick up on and help us with. That would be my suggestion. Yes, one more. Uh, we'll get to, to, to Chris. Did you have a comment too, Pat? No. Yes, ma'am. I con it's, it's just a, con a contribution. I practice a lot of emotional intelligence. In fact, we have in a big family and the big girl of the family. Yeah. We lost our parents early. So everybody's emotion was coming to me, and I realized it's love. If you want to walk in emotional intelligence, you must have love. You must love people. So I grew up loving people. I, I just love people. People don't offend me. But some people will tap your button. <laughs> when they do, I realize my heart bubbles. Then I know that I'll be offended. But I've controlled, I've de like you said, it takes time. I've developed it in such a way that it will bubble and cool down. That's right. And, I'll do it. and if somebody says something, uh, my emotions don't react. You know, some people, before you open your mouth, they react. I don't react. So I tell my friends, sometimes, even it affects me sometimes negatively where somebody brings me good news and I'm supposed to react, but I cool it off. So I tell some of them, oh, because, don't bother me. The fact I didn't react doesn't mean... Uh, I'm not happy. Right. But the whole thing is about love. That's good. Loving people, you understand them. You can pick their emotions. They, you, you can know that something is wrong. Yeah. And with emotional people, you also have to be sensitive with leaders. I can put, I always approach Pastor K and other pastors, but familiarity. So if you are that type of you know, emotional person, you don't get offended. A, a leader can toss you anyhow, you don't get offended. <laughs> but you must also be sensitive of familiarity. Yeah. So you try to create that boundary That's where right. you are still going there, but you know how to break sometimes yes. to maintain that uh, relationship and, and respect. Yeah. 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 Thank Good you. Point. Love will solve a lot of problems. Love will solve. Okay.
So Pastor Dan's recommending a 10 minute break. Is that okay? And that'll allow you for uh, restrooms or whatever you need to do. So what time is it now? It's 25 after. So uh, in 10 minutes, uh, try to try to be back to where we can get in the, the rest of the material. All right.